And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. Sorry, carbonation, and I've already screwed up my intro. I am your <laughs> one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother... Creator of the creator of the Blade RPG, and now with Basic and Generic, which is which is currently getting, which is currently just past its uh, its initial goal its initial goals with twenty four days to go. Congratulations on that. The one and only Josiah Mork. How are you doing tonight, man? I am doing wonderfully. Thanks for having me back. As my chiropractor often says, glad to see you're back. <laughs> So, it's been it's it's been a few months since I since I had you on regarding regarding Blade. How, how have you been in the interim? I've been pretty good. You know, COVID kind of took a toll. Um, had to leave school early the last semester and ended up spending about five months at home. Um, but you know, it was a good time. I got to spend some quality time with family, um, and I got to work on you know BAG. Um, a friend of mine and I kind of. He raised some thoughts about Blade, and uh, I had been a thought that was kicking around kind of in my mind since we last talked. Um, and so I got to put in some quality hours into building that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been turning out pretty well. So I think it was time well spent mm -hmm. and uh, appreciate it. But I'm glad to kind of be getting back into school, and hopefully things will be normalizing soon. So I've been pretty good. Yeah. How about yourself? Um, I've, do I've, been, I've, been doing I've been doing pretty good. When um, around the Around the time COVID put me in an awkward position because I was getting, I was right in the middle of move of moving to a new place when that when that whole thing happened. Um, oh no! I mean, I mean, I managed to get the move done because because of my crazy work ethic. Um, so it, I figured it would take me about four days to do it, and we did it in three. Um, nice. There's still a special spot in hell for whoever de whoever decided to. Des design mattresses to be, to be so damn hard to move. I know, right? Getting them around like doorways is just impossible. I had I had to move the I had to move a mattress down up down a few paces worth of hallway by myself, and now compared to like the box spring, that's easy to move. Like that's just that's just mm -hmm. a push. But the but the mattress always wants to lean in ways that it that is that. Do, are not <laughs> ideal, and you think it's only going to be like five paces, but that's that's almost that's almost like saying count to, count to sixty while holding two buckets, mm -hmm. or just or just count yeah, to, or it's just not count fun. to ten while while looking up and having your legs in the in the four position. <laughs> well, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad you got to your new place. Mm -hmm. Um. And of course, and around that time, I started making some radical changes to my diet. Start, start, and um, and doing a whole lot more, a whole lot more exercising. And back in um, back in June, I was at three hundred and fifteen, and now I'm down to two thirty-seven. Hey, good for you, man. That's amazing. Oh, I've had a few people ask what my secret is. The secret is there is no secret. <laughs> <laughs> Just a whole lot of a whole lot of tracking and um, get getting getting some equipment here, getting some light equipment here and there, and a lot of um a lot of a lot of biking. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I guess you just got to put in the hours, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, At least that's my experience. Yeah, not and take and making sure to take rest days, so it's not like I'm doing it every day. Um, sun Sunday is the day where I just, where I don't do any workout. Um, mm -hmm. and a cage and um the the other thing was just ma was just making sure to ke keep my changes as um strict as I could and a friend of mine has been helping me with that but when it now i remember i do remember sit i do remember when i sent you that that set of um stream of consciousness down notes about um about blade but did Basic and Generic originally start out as a as a Blade Second Edition? Because I do remember you talking about that. It did, yeah. So it started off 
buff just as kind of a revamp. Um, and I was going to add uh, a couple new mechanics and make it a little bit deeper, um, explore kind of some uh, melee weapon tactics and be let you like build your own uh, you know, fighting style stuff, kind of akin to the magic system, except for melee. Mm -hmm. I think we actually talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, fine tuning some of the advancement and stuff like that. But then kind of as I was working on it, it just it became a bigger project than I think it was ready for over COVID. Um, and I didn't have a firm grasp of kind of what I wanted. And then uh, this friend of mine came to me and he tried to teach me some friends uh, and his parents and stuff and um, you know it, it is a step down to D, obviously and it's mm -hmm. a relatively straightforward system um, but they were still having a hard time with it and so he kind of gave me some pointers on like how I might be able to uh, uh, a little bit more or at least tell, told me that I needed to um, and so I kind of took the advice that he had some ideas that had already been kicking around about like world generating um, and vehicles and things like that and so I figured I might as well just create a nice generic system, a nice clean system, um, using some of the ideas that I had from Blade, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but to do some do it justice to that idea that I first had of just making a simple, easy way for people to get into tabletop gaming. And that's kind of what BAG became. Mm -hmm. And now one of the, one of the things that I found it I found interesting about um, about the setup from from a bit from bag, which I'm go which I'm going to call because I am not paid by the syllable. Um, <laughs> is the is this um is this set is this splitting it off into three into three sec into three sections? How mm -hmm. did how, how did that start how did that start out and what was what's the intent with um splitting it off that way? So when I wrote the first section, I thought, all right, this will be it. Like, I'll just do the first, I think it's like 20 pages is the first section. Mm -hmm. um, 24 pages, I guess. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. It's going to be a super tiny manual. Um, but I just didn't feel like, I mean, I felt like that was a great starting point. I felt like that was an easy way for people to get into it. Uh, but I just wasn't really satisfied with the game as it was like that. And I knew that for people that were accustomed to D&D &D and stuff, that definitely wouldn't be enough. Um, and so, but I didn't want to add more to it because then I knew from my own experience that I pay super close attention to the rules for about the tw first 25 pages. And after that, I just start to get overwhelmed by the wealth of information that there is and the wealth of content and all the different abilities and spells and all this stuff from reading D and D and, and savage worlds and GURPS and stuff. Um, and so I was like, okay, how can I make it so that there's still that content there to work with, but that you don't get overwhelmed and feel like you're missing the whole back section of the game by trying to read the manual. And so I figured, you know, what is, how do other people handle this? How do you, you know, I'm at school. How does my biology textbook handle this or my math textbook handle this? And it's with modules. Like it's, you, you start with a small amount of information and you build from there. And it just worked out really well because the mechanics are clean enough that you can stack them really easily. And so you can be having people that are just playing with the first module, like at the same table as people that are playing with all three modules. Um, and so it, using kind of that strategy, because I needed some way to integrate the two players together, uh, it just happened to work out and come together. Which um, that definitely that definitely makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, when it now now I was I was able to take I was able to take a look at the at this um, at these sections, but. Give me, give me the run, give me the rundown when it comes to each section. Is it a case of basic rules and advanced rules and for, and further advanced, or how does how does each section kind of set up and what does each one um, add? Yeah, so the the first section is the most basic. So the things you're going to be using pretty much every game. It's your character creation, which obviously everybody needs to do, uh, to or at least all the players need to do to play the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's your skill rolls which is going to be the mechanic you use for almost every situation. And it's your combat, 
which is, you know, a very common theme. And even if it's not a dungeon crawl type RPG, uh, it's still a really common thing. Mm -hmm. And then in the very back are uh, just some tips for like getting started as a first time GM. Uh, or even just handling the system for the first time, just a couple pages on GMing. So it is essentially a whole RPG just boiled down to the most fundamental rules. And then the next section is uh, along the same line. I mean, it has the same flavor and the same simplicity, but it adds more characteristics, which are uh, aspect of building your character. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to kind of flesh out your character a little bit more after you've had time to play with them. Uh, it adds vehicle rules, so assuming that kind of the scope of your game is broadening, players are comfortable enough to kind of be moving on to a bigger part of the story. And so you're probably going to want vehicles to at least transport them or vehicle mm -hmm. battles or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so it adds vehicles and crafting, which was something that was really popular in Blade uh, and with a lot of our test players was crafting. But it's kind of an abstract concept, um, you know, using these the idea of uh like materials to craft these items that then you use and that can break and like turn into other uh, materials and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the crafting system itself is pretty simple, but just because it's kind of an abstract concept, um, that's in the second section of the rules. And then um, new locations. So for the GMs and stuff, uh, there's just a really simple set of uh, 12 different tables for generating um, really nice fleshed out locations. Uh, and that was just kind of move that to the second section of the rules just because, um, you know, as a first time GM, you're just trying to build the concepts. Mm -hmm. And so once you get the concepts down, then having a rule, you know, a rule system for creating locations is helpful. Yeah. Um, so that's the second section. And then the third section are more of the like large scale rules that you're going to need to be relatively detail oriented to manage mm -hmm. uh, and that's your magic system which is the open-ended magic system and uh the w managing wars and battles uh and so those are just kind of you know there are a lot of moving pieces in those for spells you have all the different parts of spells that have to come together to create them mm -hmm. uh, and for war you have all the different um train technology levels and units uh, and so those kind of, you know, all those shifting pieces, you want to be sure that you have a grasp on the fundamentals before you try and add those. So that's why they're on the third section. Mm -hmm. Now, some of, now a lot of the sections within it are, de are definitely familiar to me. Um, I did, I of course did note that you're still doing the um, D10 slash D12 approach that was done previously. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, and I think in that case is it's a matter of well um don't well don't try and reinvent the wheel, um, mm -hmm. but when it com when it comes to when I came when I came to something like warfare that was something I didn't see before was that something that kind of sprouted out from from testing around with um, blade or was it just something that you had wanted to do for a while. It was something I wanted to do for quite a while. Um, it was something that I really liked about the Savage Rule uh, Worlds Deluxe Manual. Mm -hmm. um, they have just a very rudimentary, very rudimentary idea of handling warfare. But just the fact that they addressed it was something that I really liked. Because everybody wants that at some point, you know? Like, you want to know that you're part of, like, an epic battle and your character is determining the fate of Middle Earth or whatever. You know, you mm -hmm. just that's a fun vibe. And so the idea of having a, a means of handling that, that players could go charging into battle, uh, was really fun. And actually, my roommate at university, um, he's huge into the idea of games. And uh, he loves, you know, World War One and World War II. Um, he loves studying all the different offensives and stuff, and uh, particularly the British Army and their, like, charges and uh, the tactics or lack thereof behind them. And uh, so when I told him about, you know, playing these games, that was something that he really wanted to get into. And so it's just kind of, I think people imagine that when they think of an epic story or scale is just mm -hmm. charging with your army. Um, and so that was something that I wanted to be sure to add to the rules, find some kind of a, a easy way to integrate that in, because I just think it adds so much. Yeah. And I can, I can definitely, I can definitely see that. And, Given given what you mentioned about your roommate, I I can't help but wonder if he if he at any point had tried to talk you into putting in rules for a bayonet charge. 
<laughs> I think you did actually mention that at one point. I figure it fell well enough within the within the rules that I didn't have to come up with something special for it. But he was pretty excited about it. Yeah. Um. And obvi- obviously, um, it's what it's well with it. It's well within the motif when it comes to role playing because. As anybody who's stu- who studied the early days of it knows, um, the role playing scene was a uh, what originally was an offshoot of the war gaming scene of the seventies. Mm-hmm. Dur- during the um, during the glory days of people like Avalon Hill, mm-hmm. um, and heck, one heck, one of the uh, big one of the big campaigns that would event that would eventually birth um, Blackmore was a um, napoleonic campaign you know good old pike and shot yeah and when it came, when it comes to those elements with the magic system the crafting system and the and the like did you intend for them to be a modular approach where they where they could be dropped in and dropped out as the gm needed yeah i definitely wanted it to be um you know very flexible like, like that very adaptable Mm -hmm. because one of the biggest things that irks me about games is when people pick up a manual and are trying to learn it and they hit a rule and this happened to me in D &D all the time and i would ask you know what does this rule do like how does this work and people would say oh we don't play with that and it just annoys the heck out of me because if you don't play with it why is it there or if it's too complicated to play with why is it there and i don't think bag has any of that you know that's the goal is to just Mm -hmm. trim it down to the fundamentals but at the same time, people are going to be coming into it with different levels of what they know. And so when I'm trying to teach people any game, you know, whether it's Scythe or uh, Warhammer 40K or D&D or anything, you know, I stick with the rules that they can learn quickly and then I build up from there as they're comfortable. Yeah. And so even though BAG is pretty much just the fundamentals of gaming, tabletop, you know, RPG gaming, I wanted to make sure that you could ad- adjust it as people felt comfortable and then adjust it to as you know, as the setting fits, like you shouldn't need to include magic if you want to do a low fantasy setting, you know, it should be easy to cut that out. And so I wanted to make sure that it was modularized enough for you to adapt it as you needed to. And speaking of that modularity, um, something I'm curious about if you've, if you've considered putting this in is the, is the notion of putting, um, of putting genre hacks within i.e. i.e. Mm-hmm. if some i.e. slight slight changes to some of the to some of the um rules to em, to emulate particular um storytelling genres um like for yeah. for instance for instance do, for instance one set of mods if some if one set of suggested mods if somebody's doing post apocalypse one if somebody's doing um here um, myth, mythic fantasy, one if they're doing low fantasy, that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. So I have actually considered that. I guess this is going to be kind of a an inside scoop for you. Um, but, you know, now that BAG is over, over our funding goal and, you know, we have 24 days left, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that I'd like to propose, I'm going to help decide, you know, with the backers what our stretch goals are going to be. But a couple of the ideas that are kicking around are settings for BAG, not campaigns in the sense of like a pre-plotted story, but like genuine settings with sets of NPCs and, you know, creatures and locations and rules. Like, yeah, sandboxes, exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, so for one of the things that I have kind of mapped out right now is a kind of a zombieville, you know, type setting where with crafting, you know, you can take some of the materials and there are special crafting rules that allow you to kind of scrap together weapons. You know, you might be able to take wires and weld them to your axe to give it like electrical damage or scrap metal that you can bolt to your baseball bat to give it extra damage um, or something like that. Or, you know, another setting that I'd really like to do is kind of a, Uh, take on Star Trek where not, you know, obviously the exact same thing, but the idea of that you were on a spaceship exploring. And so include a whole new section on the location generator where it has how to generate an alien race, how to generate more detailed aspects of religion and society and things like that. So a GM can just roll through all of those tables to create a nice rich planet for players to just land on at the start of an adventure and get started on. So I have kind of thought through that, but I didn't want to include it 
NBA G um, just because if people are trying to get started, that's another thing for them to have to move over uh, for them to learn the basics. Mm -hmm. But I definitely want to add it at some point through settings. That, yeah. That's the yeah, hope. Especially since a, f a fair amount of universal style games um, will have some sort of exam some sort of examples set up just to just as a this is what it looks like in action kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, of course, some of some of them some of them won't. But like one of the big one of the big examples of of chi of um of universal style games is is the juggernaut that is the hero system which was birthed from a superhero game mm -hmm. and have, and those two have kind of been joined at the hip ever since um but the other th the the other thing that I part of the reason I asked about that modularity is the is the question of how for instance if somebody wanted to do the um, warfare warfare rules but integrate uh, magic in it where you actually where you actually have magic being used enough that you can have magic literally be a um, artillery unit um mm. would it just would it just ended up working the same way as the normal warfare rules or would or um, would you be considering something a little bit different yeah i'd probably for the the base game at least that's a really good question and it kind of crossed my mind when i was structuring the warfare was how that, that would look if you mm -hmm. you know added magic for example, with it. And I think for the base game, you would probably just set it up that it would mimic artillery. Um, but I, you know, if the setting, I think a lot of those rules are there to add flavor and to add um, kind of depth rather than ease. And so if I were to do a setting like that, I think it would be really cool to have some kind of special effects or special something that you know just made it feel deeper like you're actually firing these huge spells off it across the battlefield mm -hmm. uh, i just didn't feel like you know it really fit into bag because it's a, you know it's the same system and the same mechanics but it's kind of going to try and achieve two different things in the setting book versus the core manual um and so that's another thing that i would love to include it just didn't feel quite right to include it in this rule book quite yet yeah i can i can certainly get that um one thing that I one thing that's that stood out to me when it came to the page design of the, of the book because if you've seen any of my reviews you know that um, navigation and layout is a big is a big deal for me and I've repeated I've repeatedly given people hell if they don't put an index in their books <laughs> <laughs> um, but I note but I noticed the tabs the tabs that you have on the at, on the edge of the pages for mm -hmm. when it comes to each of the chapters and I'm and that made me wonder if now obviously for an early draft that's this is not something that's going to be feasible but have you taken into consideration the idea of hyperlinks in the PDF version I have yeah so it's something that I really want to do um the I'm still kind of picking up on how the PDF part works. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't used, you know, I use Adobe InDesign and Illustrator, you know, throughout to make this book. Um, but OB, Adobe Acrobat is still something that I'm trying to uh, tinker with. And so I actually was just talking with someone a couple of days ago about using like a smart fill um, character sheet and build that into the PDF so that people could just make it from their phone. Um, and hyperlinks is a great idea. That's another thing that I'd love to add. And I, I hope to add it with time now that you mention it. Um, but it's something that I just haven't quite put into the effort for yet. But I think it, I think that'd be a great addition. Yeah, it's, it's now you're 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 likely shooting for around 60 pages, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not one, it's not one where you'd need to have a whole lot of hyperlinking, but um I'd, ima I'd imagine that at the very least, the fi the final um, PDF is going to be ha is going to have bookmarks. Yeah, I hope so. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping so. We still have a month, so it should be able to. But we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Oh, I think. And Grant, I know I I know I made the crack on Twitter a while back that um that if that for people who have lar for people who have large PDFs without bookmarks I hate I hate you but um if you're only doing 60 <laughs> pages I'm not going to give you too I'm not going to give you too much shit over over that because there's not going to be a whole lot of jumping going on and 
that's kind of the point with something like Bag. Um, <laughs> but I've seen I've seen cases where there's like two or three hundred page ones that aren't bookmarked. Oof. Yeah, no. I mean, it's all about it's all about convenience here at this point. So like scrolling is still inconvenient, whether it's sixty pages or three hundred. So I think you make a great point there. Yeah. Oh. Um, it's the the other th- the other thing I'm cur- I'm curious about is the is now in the highlights part of the Kickstarter page you kn- you um note one point two quintillion possible characters. <laughs> Did you now? Did you actually calculate how many how many potential combinations you that you could do? I did. Yeah, <laughs> I sat on my couch probably for. It shouldn't have taken me this long either, but I know I'm not a math person. I'm a comms person, so it was probably half an hour or 45 minutes running the numbers, and then I ran them another two or three times because I knew people would be skeptical of a number like that. Uh, but that's what it came out to with all the characteristics. That's not counting how you can assign your skill points. That's just um, just the characteristics. Mm-hmm. And I think no, I don't even know if I took the items into account. The items you can start with. I think that's just characteristic combinations. So if somebody threw the items in, then that then it'd probably be even higher. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, at and when it um now one of one of the one of the things that I was I was curious about is for the for the most part you are using a roll under D ten slash D twelve system. Um. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you also you also have the you also have the GM assigned MS. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it comes to because of the fact that that effectively means you have two resolution systems potentially, um, what's the general guideline that you have in terms of when one would be used versus when the other would be? Uh, it's a lot of narrative decisions so for some things you know it's kind of do you get it or don't you like uh if you're looking at a map for example like um you really just need to have any basic understanding of how to read a map you know a knowledge rule as long as you have some competence you'll be able to figure it out um but then some things you know you can you might be amazing but you're still not amazing enough to beat the task like if you're fighting a general of some region and you're just a fantastic fighter uh you still might not be a good enough fighter and so it's kind of for the gm it adds an extra fallback that if you have a character who's min maxing um and they're like a 10 you know have uh, strength 10 and they can't still they still can't defeat every enemy just because some enemies are going to be better than they are and so the adding an ms kind of gives their uh, next level of challenge Mm -hmm. and it helps add that like robust narrativeness that you can change what the challenges feel like for the players which i can i can i can definitely see that especially and especially since the it's interesting that you bring up bring up min max because the main place where i could see somebody trying to trying to pull that and even then um it would be it would be it would be a case of the benefit not really being there as much is in um characteristics mm-hmm. and i'm ge- i'm yeah. guessing that's the reason why you you elected to instead of assigning characteristics point um positive and negative characteristics point values you instead did the whole um minor medium and major mm mm-hmm. mhm that was that was kind of part of it, you know. Min maxing does come up a little bit mm-hmm. because people obviously want to emphasize the best parts of their character, um, but it's I don't know, you know. I think it's kind of fun because while it's a little bit a little bit off, you know, if you have a character that's just super hype in one thing, it can be hard as the GM to handle it. But usually, if they're doing that and they're offsetting themselves enough that, like you said, it's not a huge boon. Um, and I kind of set the the minor, medium, major thing up too because I didn't want it to all be stats based. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of the characteristics. Uh, one of the minor ones, for example, is like astronomer. You know, you recognize the stars and constellations, and that's not like 
necessarily going to come up a lot in a game, but it is a fun thing to choose as a player just because it feels like you're adding a little bit of like depth and history to your character. Um, and so kind of using that, using a point base to reflect those more role playing aspects would have been kind of difficult. And so it just kind of felt like a, a cleaner way to do it with the minor, medium, major. Eh. And also because also because of that the because of it because of that particular approach, I'd say by not doing a point not doing it in a point based manner, um, allows for allows for one to not angst as much about about how about how the thing is going to balance out. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. A repeat, a repeat line I've used when when discussing a lot of um, a lot of freeform games is the issue of choice paralysis. Yeah, yeah. It is it is like a big deal too. You know, points versus you know characteristics like they are now. You wouldn't think it's that like that big of a difference. Um, well, for one thing, points are more to keep track of, and so that's adds not a whole lot of complexity, but it adds another thing to think about. Um, and it, like you said, it is it is hard for players to make those sacrifices when they're trying to figure out how to spend their points, and it still is to some extent with having to choose which characteristics to get and what to forego. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes it just a a little bit easier, I think. So it worked out. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'm the other thing that I um, that I of course noticed is the fact that. On that little hex grid that you've got, that you've got, you well, you did hexes instead of, instead of doing square instead of doing squares. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, is that is that a reflection of the type of war games that you that you would play, or do you just prefer hexes as a personal preference thing? Uh, I guess it's a little bit of both. Um, it. And this wasn't at all the goal behind it, but uh, the hexes just kind of worked more with the retro vibe. Um, but they also just add more, you know, there's more directionality to fighting, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it gives, makes it a little bit more real when you're locked in combat and you're surrounded by like six people instead of just four. And it gives you more, you know, movement flexibility. You don't have to go straight one direction or the other um so it was a really easy way to make people feel more engaged and feel like more freedom um but again make it really simple and that's kind of the whole flavor that bag is going for so it just felt like a good flavor of map to integrate into it mm -hmm. now when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the crafting rules if somebody's coming into the crafting rules from blade and and jumping into bag um what would be some of the main differences that they'd ha that they'd have to adjust to? Oh, the biggest thing is they're not recip crafting recipes. So in Blade, there were defined, you know, you had to collect this many to make this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and in BAG, it's a little more open-ended, and that's to give GMs a little bit more freedom um, because it might work out better for the story that a player can just miraculously whip together this particular thing in the nick of time. Mm -hmm. And that particular knickknack might, might fall apart right after their turn, but it just kind of makes it a little bit more flexible. Um, and so I tried to kind of add the, cause rules are there to add consistency, obviously. And so I tried mm -hmm. to add the consistency and the steps for crafting rather than the, the precursors that you have to have for crafting. Um, and so I think as a, as a player, you just have to get a little bit more used to the fact that uh, how you craft each time is going to look more formulaic. And I think that's good because then you know how to manage your crafting and your materials. Uh, but you're going to have to be communicating more with your GM about what you can and can't be doing. Um, so that, that's a little bit different, yeah. But, which I, I can... Um... I can cer I can certainly see when it came now, when it came to the addition of of some f of um, further, a further of uh, further positive and negative um, attributes, um, in the class two section, where a lot of those were, did you intend for for those to be a lot more a lot more specific or a lot or just more complex as your goal with the class two ones. Yeah, a little bit. There were 
they were kind of the ones that people hiccuped on a lot when they were building their character uh, using Blade. And then also I kind of put together a demo of VAG and played it with a couple people where mm-hmm. I ran it by a couple people. Um, and they just kind of hiccuped a little bit. I'm like, wait, what does this mean? And I don't want you to have to run into that right as you're making your character. And so I tried to kind of substitute them with some new easier ones in the first class rules. And then in the second class, it did bump some of the more specific ones, some of the more um, situational ones. And that kind of works out well because then it's easier to build your character right off the bat. But after you've played your character for a while and you know what you're going for, then you have an opportunity to grab some more specific ones that'll help you how you want them to. And so it, it makes it doesn't lock you in as quickly to one particular play style. It get, allows you to grow more gradually, mm-hmm. which I liked a lot. And the other the other thing I'm now when it comes to this partic- when it comes to this particular setup, um, how a lot of t- a lot of times with freeform games, one of the trickier things to balance is um, monster creation and making sure that enco- that encounters aren't too skewed one one way or the other. Um, mm-hmm. Has that been something that's been brought up during testing? And if so, how do you plan on approaching it? So monster creation uh, admittedly really isn't the focus, isn't focused on too much uh, in BAG. You know, it includes a generic minor monster, a generic like pure level monster, and a generic like boss bot, uh, monster. And then uh, included in the GM section is kind of a chart of dice values that you can look at. And if you want to, you know, have your monster compete at this certain level or with a character that has this certain skill level, then you probably want to give them this dice value. And it visualizes that for you. Um, And really, that's kind of where it leaves it at. And I did contemplate adding more to it because I think that could be um, kind of a difficult Thing, that could probably be one of the most difficult points for GMs to handle going into a game of BAG is how to structure their monsters. Um, but at the same time, I felt like if I dug into it too specifically, then GMs would feel like they had to spend all this time figuring out how it worked. And and honestly, maybe this isn't a good thing, but I, it worked out for us really well. Is trial and error was just a huge... Um, it, it just worked out really well. It was a huge part of our playtesting mm-hmm. was, you know, the chart with all the different dice levels and dice results that you can predict gave me a good place to plug in different character or different creature skill levels. And so in BAG, instead of having the skill points, you have a dice value because the creature can never fail its role. It just rails, rolls a certain result. And so I kind of had an approximate idea of what I want the result result to be and so i used the chart um with the different dice values on it Mm -hmm. and sometimes they ended up being overpowered and and it made for a really interesting encounter because then the players had to run away or they had to get creative and sometimes there was really you know underpowered and the boss was not that bossy after all and it, it it did add some unexpectedness to it and so that might be something that's not for everybody um but it kept it easy to learn it kept it fast it kept it visual and it kept it unexpected, which made for a fun adventure. Well, as we say around here, the dice gods are merciless. <laughs> that definitely happened a couple times, yeah. And the other, th- the other thing that I that I noticed with both Blade and with BAG is this is is that this resolution system is a strict on off um, approach, which leads me to two questions. One. Is the ma- is the matter of cho- of the choice of not to include some sort of extra effect when it comes to the equivalence of critical successes and failures, and two, the how do you feel about the concept of fail forward? Uh, what do you mean by fail forward? Um, I'll give you a moment. I'm going to get the specific definition. Okay. Yeah, it's probably a term. I'm just not. I'm just not super familiar with it. All right. Oh. And it gave. And I specifically need the. So, fail forward is is a concept that's come that's been making the rounds in RPG circles for, for the last almost a decade. 
or at least since I, at least since I found about uh, found out about it. Um. And the the approach to the approach to it is that a fail roll a, fa a failing roll is not necessarily a dead stop narratively. It's a mm. it's a case of you the um it's more of a but something ha but something happened instead oh. the the co and this is admittedly a topic that's some um, that's put up that's put a fair amount of debate but it's more of treating failures as if they're as if they're not a stop to the story's momentum like if some if somebody is rolling t if somebody is rolling to pick a lock and in, and they don't make the cut instead of doing some sort of well you f you fa you um you just fail at you just fail at picking the lock instead doing a thing of well you tr you you try well you tried to pick the lock but your but the tools that you have don't mi don't match the um keyhole that you were trying to use or, some, or something like that. You still fail the role, but you have, you have more of a, you have more of a narrative momentum with it. And that's a simple, right. that's a simplified version of it. But I'm curious if that's a particular debate that's been brought up um, during development. So it, now that you like, yeah, explain it. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm kind of familiar with that concept. Yeah, and it was something that kind of you know stymied characters a little bit. Um, there'd be a couple times where people thought that a skill really wasn't that important. Vigor was a really common one, which is odd. People just didn't think it was that important. And then, um, you know, they drop a vial and sleeping gas fills the room and suddenly they're all asleep because nobody put Vigor skills. And uh, as the GM, you know, then I'm kind of in a tough spot and they're kind of in a tough spot. Um, and so the failing forward would be one way to resolve it. But the way we usually resolved it was just kind of, you know, introduce something else in the story. And so uh, one of the times it was one of the player's pet goose um, pulled them out of the room and they came back to life. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not came back to life, but, you know, woke up and stuff like that. And, and so it wasn't, um, I don't know that that's the best way to do it. I don't know that failing forward would necessarily be the best either because I do like, you know, the the blackjack style where you fail or you make it or you go over. Um, and so it's something to play with. It's an idea to try. But for us, it you know, the storytelling is still there, whether it's the players just aren't failing in the same way or whether the GM is adding another element. Um, but there is a lot more communication that you need. You know, as the GM, you need to just know what your characters are expecting so that you can kind of build around that enough to challenge them, but enough to also make sure that their characters are relevant. Yeah. And so I guess I didn't really think of that as much because I tried to make it um, something where there was a lot of interaction between the GM and the players enough that hopefully that would be a problem. Um, and it hasn't been a huge problem. Like I said, like it was easy enough to resolve those couple instances with just narrative points. Uh, but it's, it's definitely something to think about in the future editions. I'd be really eager, you know, once the game comes out, once people start playing it, if that's a, something that comes up a lot, I mean, it's something I'd love to add. It just hasn't really come up that much yet. And it's, and K given, given all the talk when it comes to, te when it comes to, um, testing, what now you had you had tested BAG a, f a fair a fair amount um, before the before you launched the Kickstarter. Um, what <laughs> were what were some of the big takeaways that you ended up getting from that test? Um, well, so the first one, which was really reassuring for me, is that people can actually learn it. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted a game that people could learn quickly. And so I grabbed a pool of willing friends at college that had never played before any any type of role playing game before, and essentially emailed them the PDF and was like, "All right, if you guys want to play, like this is what we're working with, and we'll you know be playing Wednesday night." And uh, and obviously I was there to answer any questions and stuff. But by you know Wednesday night, everybody knew what they were doing, and that was really assuring. You know, going into the game. Um, a couple things that I did realize uh, needed a little bit of clarifying was just the, the whole skill role 
system mm-hmm. because you know it is just rolling a d10 or a d12 um but there is like you know you have to know what to do with that number and so there were the first probably session session and a half that we did people kind of had to look to me to tell them like what do i do with this number and so i had to rework you know in the very front of the book um people when they get it they'll see a quick tip section which breaks that down exactly what you do in a skill role and what you do in a combat just like in bullet points Hmm. and then obviously it's fleshed out more in the core section of the rules and so adding those was really important and rephrasing a couple things in the in the explaining uh skill roles was really important um so that people knew what they were doing uh when they made a skill role and other than that, that was that was really oh, uh, magic was another thing that came up. Once we got to the magic section, um, it was really tough for people to use magic at first. Some of the MS modifiers, you know, when you take the different ingredients to build your spell, and each contributes to the minimum success of the roll, um, some of them just contributed too much, and it almost made magic unplayable. Uh, as like a first level character and i didn't want magic to be unplayable you know i wanted it to be difficult because it's you know it's magic it's supernatural but i didn't want it to be impossible and so i had to knock some of those down to a happy medium Mm -hmm. Um, but those were those were about it everything else rolled pretty smoothly yeah it's it's funny it's funny to me that um that in that in the in the tldr for the kicks for the um kickstarter it mentions um, com- compatible with all genres or, fa- or factions, and Warhammer is brought up. And yeah. since you mentioned <laughs> since you mentioned magic and Warhammer in this in the same um, the same conversation, un- unfortunately, this means that I do ha- I do have to <laughs> I do have to bring I do have to bring up the fun parts of magic casting within war- within Warhammer setup, namely the f- namely the whole. Well, in 40k, it's perils of the warp, and it's and it's equivalent in um, fantasy. But the fact that doing spell casting is a case of thr- a case of throwing the winds of magic together and hoping you don't explode or worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It, oh, go ahead. And, and what I'm curious, of, what I'm curious about is how would you, if somebody said that they wanted to do something Warhammer like with that with that or rather emulate that that style of magic. Um, how would you have them do it within the magic system of Beg? So actually, I'm really glad you asked that because Warhammer, I kind of, I didn't create the magic system with Warhammer in mind per se, but I was really happy with how smoothly it looked like it would transition to Warhammer. Mm-hmm. Because in Warhammer, uh, like you mentioned, when you're doing a psychic power, you roll 2d6, and uh, you can get perils on double ones or double sixes. Um, and it works out because in BAG, you roll a D12, which, you know, its range is 1 to 12 instead of 2 to 12, but the idea is the same. And so you could actually, if you have your codex for, you know, say, Thousand Suns, you could just use the exact, you know, a warp charge necessary for each thing and just roll a d12 instead of a 2d6 and in that case you know it might look a little bit different like 11 and 12 are perils of the warp and 1 and 10 are successful or something like that um because obviously in bag your 11 and your 12 rolls are always failures because your skill level is maxed at 10 um but the idea that both the warp charge that's necessary and in BAG, the skill roll, are going to be somewhere between 1 and 12. You're rolling really similar dice, try and get a really similar result, um, and you both have automatic failures built into them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it'd be pretty easy. You'd have to get a little creative when you did powers of the warp uh, or perils of the warp. But I think if you did it on 11 and 12, so it would work pretty well. Um, given, the f- given the fact that Cubicle, that cubicle 7's... Um recent forays with warhammer 40k with um wrath and glory use a d- use a d6 based pool um mm-hmm. i do think i do think some of it could be carried over a, a bit there would still need to be a little a little bit of finagling since it's using a pool based d6 system and you're not mm-hmm. but the foundation is still the foundation is still there to a degree also since you mentioned thousand suns magnus did nothing wrong <laughs> oh, that sounds like heresy to me. 
Um, <laughs> no, the reason, the reason I say it is because Lorgar did everything wrong. Fuck that guy. Well, I feel like if we're relying on the Imperium's records, we really have no idea what happened. But let's just say don't go with Papa Nurgle and everything else is, is up for grabs. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to... I try not to sleep with crazy anyways. Um, but I... <laughs> well, that avoids slainish at least. Yeah. Um, I just think, I just think that I just, I just, um, enj- I enjoy my fair, my fair amount of memeing when it comes to, when it comes to Warhammer, just like, in, just like anybody else. Um, mm-hmm. that, that and Warhammer will, will be one of the rare cases where I can, where I can deal with elves that, that aren't complete dicks. And I lo- <laughs> you've probably seen the Warhammer quest thing that Bravra d- did, which involved having a dwarf engaging in dwarven diplomacy i.e. insulting you for two minutes <laughs> i don't know about that whole El- annoying bit i mean those dracari aren't exactly friendly and i can't think of the craft world being super kind to the imperium anytime well well uh, Eld- well for the 40k version oh though oh fuck those guys eldar are, eldar are dicks <laughs> <laughs> they, they're the same. They're the same people who thought who thought that engage in negotiations with the with the emperor meant bur- meant bursting right into holy terra and and wrecking everybody's shit just to say we wanted we <laughs> want to arrange a truce. The beast is yeah. fucking stupid. Well, I hate. I liked half of the Beast Arises as a as a novel. This. The stuff with all the assassinations was great. The rest of the stuff was shit. Oh. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to when, but those are those are cert, those are certainly some things to to consider. And I'm guessing that um that there was the thought at some point of do, of of doing of doing um modifiers based on based on fantasy races or, or the like. But that got but that got nicked. Yeah, races were an idea. Um, there were actually there was an idea at one point where I did like a, a skill tree of like cybernetic upgrades too, um, and so but those were you know they added another set of modifiers that people had to keep track of. They added another step to character creation that people had to go through, um, and they did add some degree of flavor. But I found that a lot of players actually came up with their own flavor for the characters when they were assigning their skills. Like, actually, in the group that I ended up playing with um, at school when we were playtesting, we had uh, a fairy, we had a, a human, we had a cyborg human, and we had, I think, a half-elf, I think it was. Um and that was without any prompting by me. That was without any races included in the book. It was just people had the imagination and they used that to explain their skills. And I think that worked a lot better for at least the, where Bag is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, you know, it makes it all about the imagination and the imagination is built on the stuff that's already there instead of adding another set for people to go through. Uh, so it just worked out for this version of the rules or for at this point from the rules. Which that may I can de- I can definitely see that. Now, when it com- now um, when it comes to the when it, when it comes to the uh, setup, um, I realize this is something that se- that seems fairly obvious, but do you get do you guys plan on ha- on having a index? So I kind of waffled on that because you know with the the table of contents in the beginning it kind of points you in the right direction um but like you said you know a little bit earlier indexes are really really helpful and and so it's something that you know i could add an extra page and i could add an index i was just weighing um i guess the value of that versus you know the table of contents but actually that's something i I wouldn't mind getting your opinion on like what do you think do you think using the manual or learning the manual um do you think an index would be would be helpful yes because as nice as table of contents can be um a lot of a lot of times there there will be mo- there will be moments where 
someone will need a very specific thing looked up. And mm-hmm. that's that's the reason why I always harp on it harp on um, indexes because I know I know some people say, well, if well if it's if it's that low of a page size, then why not just use the table of contents? Um, I always flash back to the to the woefully inadequate table of contents in a lot of White Wolf books in the '90s and 2000s, um, mm. where it just listed the chapters, but it didn't list any, it didn't list any of the sub things. And while they did have an index. Um, it's one of those. Th- it's one of those things where I prefer. I prefer. Gi- I prefer giving people the means to f- to look something up as quickly as possible. And mm-hmm. the more tools to do that, the better. And while some of while some of that is a little bit easier when you can do when you can do text lookup on a PDF, um, that doesn't take into account what if somebody is using a printed version. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. We'll have to add that in. Mm-hmm. But now you ha- now, as I said earlier, you've got twenty four days to go. This is going to be finished a couple days after after Christmas, after everybody's had time to regret drinking eggnog again. <laughs> Seriously, eggnog is disgusting. Um, oh no, I fully support that. Yeah, it's it's nasty. <laughs> And I would I would say they'd also regret eating fruitcake, but let's be honest, nobody eats fruitcake. The fruit That's cake just that a punchline ex- these days. The fruitcake that exi- much like much like with candy corn, all the fruitcake in the world was made a hundred years ago. It just keeps getting recycled. Oh, that's that's a really nasty but really true description of candy corn. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but what would what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for? At the very least, the digital version. I know that there's a few more complications when it comes to releasing physical, especially these days. Yeah, I aim to get the digital edition to people. Um, I'm not entirely sure what I have on the Kickstarter. I can actually look it up. I tried to be a little bit pessimistic on the Kickstarter just to be sure that I could get it to delivered to everybody by the time... Um, Unless I'm I said I would. it, you have I I... estimated delivery on the page March 2021. Okay, so, you know, I, I don't think it'll take that long. Uh, I need to poke around a little bit to just figure out, because I know people do send out the PDF. You know, some people use Dropbox, some people, like, message it to people, some people use different cloud mm-hmm. accesses or... Um, I know they're like password protected ways that you can have people access it and stuff. So, I mean, I need to research how, what the best method is going to be. And that will probably depend on how many backers we end up with. Um, And then after that though, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, adding the hyperlinks, adding the bookmarks, like you mentioned, that was a great idea. Uh, So I'll put those in. Um, So honestly, it, it should be in people's computers by the end of January. Um, I, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Um, so I think that's when you could probably expect it. Yeah. I'll probably still be frozen by then because January is the brutal time of the year. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I'm in Michigan, man. I know what you mean. It's It gets cold. Now, granted, anything's better than that polar vortex from a few years ago, which was co- too cold even by my standards. Oh, yeah. I got to love that two feet of snow and, like, negative 30 degrees. Woo! I was I was in the middle of that vortex. It was negative sixty five. Oh my word! That is just too cold for anyone. <laughs> well, yeah, it was it it was bad enough to the point where my boss emailed me and said, "Don't come in." Oh, that's that's good of him. <laughs> Man, that's was, cold. Well, I I stepped out to take I I stepped out for like a bit to take care of the trash, and I could be, I had I had like two layers on, and I could barely breathe. Oh my word! So, uh, I um, gained a newfound respect for anybody working at, in Antarctica after that. Oh, for sure. Well, hopefully, it'll we'll have a game for you to help get through that January February season. Um, however, I at the very at the very least, um, when it get when it gets that cold, I don't have anybody trying to talk me into doing ice fishing. <laughs> There you go. That's one perk. Mm-hmm. But 
with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And did I lose you for a second there? Does that? Does I had a Discord break on you? And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody!